For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hello and welcome back to Chasing Excellence, a show about chasing what truly matters. My name is Pat Crummings. As always, I'm here with Ben Bergeron. Hello and how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Very excited, Patrick. Me too. We've got something uh, fun this time for you. Uh, many years ago, some folks will remember, we put out some posters. This was back in what we called Project Elevation Days. And those posters had like the tactics or actions across each one of our five factors that we felt like were the sort of the biggest movers or had the, had the most leverage. And so we're not directly going to be revisiting those posters, but we take, took that as sort of a inspiration for this conversation. What we're going to do this time around is we're going to give uh, you all out there the four key actions or tactics to take across all five of the factors that, again, we feel like have the biggest bang for the buck. Cool? Yeah, I think that we're maybe this is just the next layer down from the posters. So we have sure. the if we're just thinking about this like an upside down, like an ice cream cone, right? The top yep. is what are the the factors? Eat, sleep, train, mm-hmm. think, and connect, right? What are the 10 driving principles of those? That's what we walk through and we walk through all the time on this on the show. That's what the posters did. And these these are probably the four tactics, the four Mm -hmm. actionables that you could do on a daily basis to drive towards those. Obviously, as we get into these, it's these are individualized and which ones you should lean into are bigger or greater, depending on a lot of things, most notably like where you are and where you want to go. Yep. And I'm selfishly excited because I actually just started kind of actually separate of this, of planning this episode. I started to sit down and actually try to get myself more organized around Mm -hmm. what does it look like on a weekly basis to pursue the five factors better. And I use, I use organized very intentionally because of course I've always done them, but I wouldn't say that I've done all five of them in a very organized or systematic way. And so I'm excited to use this as an excuse to further drill down into my thinking so that, again, so that we can all collectively be like, okay, next Tuesday, I know what I'm doing, which is always sort of the filter I like running these things through. Is this helpful in a sense of like, it tells me what I'm going to do next Tuesday or next Thursday or two weeks from now. And so hopefully that's what we'll be able to help folks do uh, this time around. Yeah. This, I think people have been listening for a little bit, know that I track my behaviors on a daily basis every single day, 365. I go, what are the 20 things I want to be doing on a daily and weekly basis? These have a huge amount of overlap, but they're not necessarily totally trackable. Some are like bigger movers type stuff. Go do this thing. So you're setting yourself up for success. Mm -hmm. Let's dive right in. We're going to do the move category first. I'm going to give the four tactics and then we'll come back through and we'll sort of do a a little checkbox on each one of them. So here are the four tactics we've got with the four actions to take for the move category. Number one, combine compound body weight and lifting with cardio at intentional levels of intensity five to six times a week. Number two, lift weights two to three times a week, focus primarily on the slow lifts. Number three, prioritize enough mobility work that you have no major range of motion restrictions. And number four, run short, far, fast, slow, and often. So let's do that first one first. Combine compound body weight and lifting with cardio at intentional levels of intensity five to six times per week. Let's unpack that. (laughs) Yes, let's unpack it. Okay. Between those four, you are getting such an incredible, incredible breadth of capacity, which is what we're really looking for, ready to handle any and every challenge that might be presented to you, whether voluntary or involuntary, meaning you volunteer to sign up to run a marathon, you want to be able to ski on the weekends, or the involuntary things like decrepitude or facing a, an, an emergency. So that's what this is about. So this is not necessarily about how to run a sub 230 marathon. This is not how to get to a thousand pound back squat. This is not how to prepare for the NFL combine. This is any and every conceivable challenge that might be presented to you as a human being. We can say that you will be more than prepared. 
than you than you would be otherwise had you gone in a different route. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the backdrop to what we mean by moving. So um, we always talk about in terms of the biggest one, kicking ass in our 90s, because I think that's the biggest challenge that is coming to all of us. You know, stay healthy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this first one, I could talk for um, – an hour about this without, <laughs> yep. I mean, re- I, I would love to, maybe we do that sometime. Yes. Yep. But this is the one that if you're going to, these are ranked order, by the way, in order, top priority being five to six days a week, combine, compound, weightlifting and body weight movement. So let's just t- stop there. Five or six days a week, go to the gym. That's what it means. Yes, gardening is good. Yes, going for walks is good. 10,000 steps is good. Having an active job is good. We want you to train. We are not going to be able to fight off decrepitude or any of these challenges without training for them. Our lives, no matter how active they are, they pale in comparison to our Paleolithic ancestors. We need to train. Like we, we are in such a environment of sedentarism of comfort that we have to put our bodies through more challenges than they did because it's not a part of our normal everyday life. Mm-hmm. How do we do that the best? Compound movements, meaning not isolation. There's a place for bicep curls and lateral raises and hamstring curls and doing crunches. But the major thing we need to do is compound movements, dead, lunge, squat, jump, run, pull up, push up, burpee, like multiple, multiple joints body weight and weightlifting and cardio. Now I'm using the word cardio. The fancy word for that is monostructural, but that Mm -hmm. means run, row, ski, bike, swim, that type of stuff. The best training is when you combine ideally all three of those into one workout, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that. One day could be running and thrusters, weightlifting. Another day could be Cindy, three different body weight movements. Another day, meaning push up, pull up and air squat. Basically you want it, but you want to try to get as much of those into the week as possible in a way that gets you out of breath. So it's not just do a set of air squats, 15 air squats, walk around the gym, check your phone, do a set of bench press, walk around, check your phone, and then jump on a treadmill and run a mile. Mm-hmm. It's do air squats, bench, run a mile <laughs> with things. no yeah. rest. That's yep. what it is. So people in the CrossFit space, this is not going to be earth shattering, but the earth shattering part might be that you want to combine all three of those whenever possible. Shouldn't be every day, but you know half the day should be that, and five or six days a week we should be doing that. Take it. Lift weights two to three times a week. Focus primarily on the slow lifts. What do we What do we mean by slow lifts? Slow. It's it's confusing because the slow lifts are the power lifts, but the lifts that produce the most power are the Olympic lifts. Mm-hmm. Like how poorly <laughs> named those are. So the power lifts are the slow lifts. The slow lifts being squats, front and back, hip hinge, deadlift, traditional and sumo and the upper body presses, overhead presses and bench presses. Strength matters. As Ripto said a long time ago, I wish I I should do his like Texas accent, but stronger people are harder to kill and more useful in general. Like Mm -hmm. that's just, it's true. Like it's that we want to be strong and it's not just for those purposes. The harder to kill part is not just like fighting off an attack. It actually means longevity. Like yep. stronger people live longer. They also not only lifespan, they have better health span. One of the big reasons for both of those is not only the the muscle mass, which is so correlated with longevity, but the actual bone mineral density that comes from strength training. We've been told forever that bones matter, osteoporosis is bad. And that you're going to improve your bone density by doing impact things like running and jumping. Jump rope, but if you want to increase your bone density, run and jump rope. That's what we were told forever. Turns out that will have some effect on bone density, but mechanical tension is actually what creates better bone mineral density. And that comes from the muscles pulling on the ligament tension, especially like your muscles are connected to ligaments. And that from there, those pull 
on the bones about a joint. And it's basically, think of it like trying to almost break a bone. And the resisting of that is what creates the actual greatest bone density. Just to further drive how much that matters, all-cause mortality goes up by 30% for people that break their hip over the age of 65. What that means is one in three people that break their hip over the age of 65 will be dead in a year. That's crazy. That's like bonkers. That's how much it matters. So we want to work on bones, not only muscles, and but bones matter too. If we want to work on the bones, what's the biggest thing that's going to have to create the most mechanical tension? It's the slow lifts. Olympic lifting is cool. Isolation, bodybuilding is cool. But those slow lifts, nothing will compare to those slow lifts. Mm-hmm. Number three, prioritize enough mobility work that you have no major range of motion restrictions. So this is a, a neat way to say, do what you want to do in terms of foam rolling, stretching, yoga, warming up, whatever it might be to make sure you have no restrictions in terms of range of motion. What do we mean by that? You can squat ass to ankles until your butt can touch your ankles at the bottom of squat. You don't have enough mobility about your ankles and hips, maybe your knees, but that's the, really the big ones. We want to make sure that you could essentially press a barbell, a weighted barbell, over your head. So the barbell is over your heels, not out in front of your toes. So standing strict barbell press with a close grip, meaning that your hands are covering your shoulders. I'm showing it right now, but Mm -hmm. imagine your hands almost about a thumb distance away from each other. Can you press that barbell over your head? So it's in line with your heels, not your toes. That requires a lot of capacity about your shoulder. Now, there's a whole bunch of other ranges of motion, but those are the two primary ones. If you can do those two things, you probably don't have a lot of restriction in terms of your mobility. So do what you need to do. I like stretching. Other people love foam rolling. Other people love yoga. Like I, Other love people love pliability or mobility or whatever it might be. Active, PNF, it doesn't... To me, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you don't have restrictions. Now, once you have those two capacities, the other stuff is not needed. It's kind of like having excess levels of strength. You don't have to be able to back squat 800 pounds. Mm -hmm. Once you can back squat double your body weight, we probably want to steer our attention towards other things like mobility, like cardiovascular endurance. We don't want excess capacities. So we're not saying be able to do a split. We're not saying be able to, you know, touch your hands, one hand, like you're doing that, try to scratch your back type thing where one hand goes up behind your head and the other one goes up your back and you have to touch. We're not concerned about those things. We just want a level of mobility that's not restrictive. Last one, run short, far, fast, slow, and often. Running matters. Mm -hmm. Running mat, so it's the most functional thing. If there was an emergency, call it what you want, either a natural disaster or a tree falls and you got to get out of the way, the zombie apocalypse, and you got to run from checkpoint A to checkpoint B, what, whatever. People always talk about like squatting is the most functional thing because you got to be able to get off the toilet. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to be able to walk to the toilets, like, and we think about it in terms of, uh, Um, crawl, walk, run. It's a progression. A burpee is getting off the ground, but we don't want to be able to just get off the ground. We want to be able to drop to the ground and pop back up. We need excess capacity. So we want excess capacity, not only be able to run fast out of the burning building, away from the tree that's falling, whatever it might be. We also want to be able to run medium and long. So run at all distances and all be able to do it all. All right, that was the move category. We're gonna jump right into the recover bucket. Here are the four. Create a sleep opportunity of eight to nine hours and wake up at the same time every morning. Wind down every night, avoiding screens, work, caffeine, and alcohol. Number three, sleep in complete darkness. Number four, keep your bedroom between 62 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, that first one, create a sleep opportunity of eight to nine hours and wake up at the same time every morning. So first off, in terms of recovery, we're really talking about sleep here is the big thing. It's the biggest thing in terms of your recovery. And what we want to do is be able to give yourself a sleep 
opportunities. Most of us are going to lose an hour of sleep from the, we're going to get an hour less sleep a night than we think we mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. From tossing and turning to staring at the ceiling to getting up to go to use the, the restroom. We want to be able to get at least seven hours upwards of nine hours of sleep. That means we need to give ourselves a sleep opportunity every night of at least eight hours. What that means is lights out to lights on is eight hours, which is paradigm shifting for a lot of people because they go, well, I'm getting eight hours of sleep because I went to bed at midnight and I got up Mm -hmm. at eight in the morning. Well, then that's going to be closer to seven. The next one is your circadian rhythm matters a ton, a ton, a ton. Your circadian rhythm is set by a lot of different factors. One of the biggest being a consistent wake up time. You're basically just telling your body, this is when I wake up. And there's basically like a ticking clock of hormonal release that sets it up that, okay, that means I'm going to be able to get tired at this time. If you wake up at one morning at six, the next one at 10, again at 10, and the next one is at seven, and again at six, those three hour swings really make it challenging for your body to know when it's time to fall asleep. Hmm. Number two, wind down every night, avoiding screens, work, caffeine, and alcohol. So, so the, no vodka uh, sodas, no vodka so sodas. No Red Bull vodkas. That's even worse. Good call. Yes. Right? So yes. the alcohol and the caffeine, I think are pretty straightforward. Alcohol will destroy your sleep. You might think that it helps you fall asleep faster and it might make you stay asleep throughout the night, but it's not the same quality sleep. So mm-hmm. even if you feel like that, anyone that's worn a whoop or another wearable, that's kind of taken notice of this will notice this. It's the first thing that people start talking about. They're like, I can't believe how that one drink affected my sleep. My wife was surprised when she noticed her HRV getting all all over the place on the like the one night a week she had a glass of wine or something. She's exactly. like, man. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like you're plugging in that you had a glass of wine. It, it doesn't know that you had that, but it's just, it can tell. The next one is caffeine. Caffeine has a, a half-life and the half-life is different for all of us. But half-life basically means if you feel the effects of caffeine for three hours, the next three hours, you will feel half of that effect. The next three hours, you'll feel uh, half of that half effect and so on. So if you have caffeine after noon, meaning after 12 o'clock, there's a really strong likelihood that that's going to affect your sleep. So I'm not against caffeine. I like caffeine, but I'm very cognizant of not having it after 12. If I feel like I'm a little bit drowsy at two or three o'clock and I need to pick me up, I I look for an alternative. It's really a death spiral because then you you have it and then you don't get as great a night's sleep. So you're more tired the next day. And that's the the sewer cycle we're all trying to stay out of. The -hmm. other ones are also stimulants. So they will, whether it's stress inducing from screens or work, work is, it just puts you into that fight or flight and now your, your central nervous system is basically switched away from rest and repair and gone into fight or flight. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel like it. It's not like you're ready to like, you know, you know, fight a bear, <laughs> but your, your body is not primed for sleep. Number three, sleep in complete darkness. So light matters. And maybe this is so much from the Huberman. He's, he's basically like an eye scientist mm-hmm. who's gotten really, really popular. And he is <laughs> really into eyes and light. And he's not the only one. Even the, the guys that are all about, you know, Matt Walker and others have talked to, at great depth about this in terms of how light will affect, again, your circadian rhythm. It's telling your body it's daytime. So your body will produce different hormones. Um, Higher cortisol, which we're supposed to have in the morning, will come out later. Melatonin, which produces later in the day, doesn't happen. And it kind of messes things up. I will say, you know, we talked about a study a long time ago about mm-hmm. where they did a study where they shot, shined, shone, shone, sh- shone, shone, shone yeah. a light. That is a weird <laughs> word. Where they took a light and, oh, I'm going to get away from it, and, and shone it. <laughs> there was a light in the room. Okay. <laughs> where they had people sleep in total darkness, but they put a light behind their knee. And the study was like, your body has receptors all over it that can detect light. The findings of that study were not replicable. So that Mm. has since been disproven. So it is like an eye mask works. 
is really what I'm – it's like you got, got to keep it out of your eyes is the big thing. Your eyes are the thing that's going to sen- uh, be sensitive to that. And closing your eyes is obviously not enough. So you need to be in total darkness, meaning even things like glowing electronics should be covered up. And we do that in our room. We have things mm-hmm. that you know we use a sleep aid, but we put a little towel over the glowing yep. thing. Our alarm clock, we use the hatch, and the hatch is like yep. the, this dim thing that you can see only if you look at it. Use blackout shades, so yep. you know when the sun is up for you know the longest day of the year, which we're coming up towards, you get to sleep when you're supposed to sleep. Last one: keep your bedroom between 62 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sorry, I didn't do the conversion for for Celsius. I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, I don't know what it is either. But it's cool. <laughs> That's cool. It's it's what it comes down yeah. to. We we sleep best at cooler temperatures. I would say that there's probably a degree or two for, for individuals on the, the end of the spectrum here. But if you have the opportunity, air conditioning is awesome. Like it, <laughs> it is, it, it really is. Yeah. You know, there's like certain cities that wouldn't exist without air conditioning. Phoenix would not exist had we not invented air conditioning. Las Vegas would not exist without air conditioning. We would not sleep as well as we would in the summer months without air conditioning. So this is not you just being like soft. This is not you just being complacent to the comforts of modern society. Take advantage. Just like we now have pillows, not rocks. Uh, if you have the opportunity to chill your room to 62 to 68, which has been shown to be the, the, the things. And then put blankets on. That's what's mm-hmm. cool. Is you don't have to be cold. You want to be in a cold room and then use blankets. I just did the conversion. It's 16.7 to 20 degrees Celsius. So cool. Turns out that, that wasn't hard to do. So, okay. That was the recover bucket. We've got three more buckets, but first a quick word of thanks from a few sponsors and we'll get right back into it. We're brought to you this week by the Defender family of vehicles. Let me introduce you to the Defender 110. It's not just a vehicle. It's a symbol of a lifestyle of adventure. Head to LandRoverUSA.com slash Defender to learn more about the 110 and the other vehicles in the Defender family from the six seat Defender 90 to, to the adventure loving 110 to the Defender 130, which can fit up to eight people. This iconic vehicle has been redefined with thoroughly modern design, built with robust materials and integrity and made for adventure. Whether you're facing off-road challenges or harsh weather conditions, the Defender 110 lets you go further and do more. Just like you strive to push your boundaries in the gym, so does the Defender 110 in its capability. It's a vehicle that empowers exploration and adventure. And guess what? It's not just about the journey. The Defender 110 ensures you travel with style and confidence. Its intuitive driver display and award-winning infotainment center keeps you connected throughout your journey. So embrace the impossible. Explore with greater confidence with the Defender 110, built for the modern explorer just like you. Visit LandRoverUSA.com slash Defender to learn more about this amazing vehicle. LandRoverUSA.com slash Defender. Check it out and let the adventure begin. We are also brought to you this week by a new sponsor, Dewer, spelled D-U-E-R. They make stretch performance denim and lifestyle apparel for men and women, but they're more than that. Dare I say, they're a lifestyle choice. Learn more at shopdoer.com slash excellence to see everything they've got and to save 20% off your first purchase. What sets Dewer apart? Other than being wildly comfortable, I've been wearing their no sweat shorts for a few weeks, and I gotta say, I'm not normally a shorts guy, but I'm loving these. They're all about plant-based and recycled materials. Are you a shorts guy, Ben? You're a shorts guy. I, ben. I am a shorts guy and I've been wearing Dewar as well. I wore Dewar to my my 11-year-old had his fifth grade band concert yep. last night. And I wore Dewar fun. shorts and a Dewar shirt to it. Good. That's right. They did send us some shirts too. 95% of the fibers Dewar uses are plant-based or recycled and they're on a mission to eliminate plastic from their apparel, which is something we can all get behind or I guess get inside of, as the case might be. They also own their own production factory, which ensures high quality across products and oversight of safe ethical operations. And their emphasis on timeless, seasonless styles supports their philosophy to do more with just a few well-made things. This means less waste and a wardrobe you can rely on year round. If you're looking for jeans or shorts that you can bike to work in that look great at the office and that are perfect for an evening out, Doer is the brand for you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first purchase when you use this URL, shopdoer.com slash excellence. They've also got flagship stores in LA or Denver if you happen to be living there. Either way, don't wait. Get 20% off. Go to shopdoer.com slash excellence. Yeah, I was impressed. I think this stuff is really cool. It's super comfy and stylish. 
Okay, let's jump back into our actions here. We're gonna do eat the eat bucket next. Number one, remove ultra processed foods from your home and work. Number two, consume a varied and unrestricted amount of vegetables and fruit. Number three, eat three quarters of a gram of clean protein for every pound of body weight. And number four, avoid alcohol and added sugar. First one first, remove ultra processed foods from your home and work. I like that I like we've got work in there too. You can't, you can't hide there. You can't hide your snacks there. Totally. So here's the, is, you know, as EC said, the, the commonality against for all, I'm going to butcher it, but basically all failed diet attempts or the, the, the common evil is processed food. So I'm not saying never have processed food. I'm saying don't have it within arm's reach. That's the yep. problem is that we don't have the willpower. We don't. Like they've spent trillions of dollars of finding the perfect amount of crunch, salt, and sweet to make you want to take a bite. They've like, – they're, they're just – like we, we're all aware of how much the, the social platforms are putting into creating an algorithm that's addictive, but we're kind of like, yeah, but food is food. And it's because they constantly tell us like, and it's healthy for you and you want this and you need, you got to get it out. You got, I am like, this is the number one thing. Get it out of the house. Don't allow it in your workspace. At the gym, people used to bring in donuts. They used to bring in mm. birthday cakes on people's birthdays. Well, guess what? In a week, we have six birthdays every week. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. It's like if you want ice cream and it's there, guess what you're going to do? Like we got to get away from processed foods. We got to get away from it. Not never have it. On your birthday, on your 11-year-old's birthday, on your best friend's birthday, have a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. That might be six, seven times a year. Your close family and very close friends – I'm okay with every other month you having birthday cake. Totally cool. If once a month you want to get pizza, awesome. But don't have microwavable frozen pizza in your freezer. Similar to that, if you want to on a Thursday night with the kids walk, to, this is what we do. We walk to town and get an ice cream. Awesome. Like that's that's phenomenal. Don't have pints of Ben and Jerry's in there that you're eating ice cream every single night that you're watching Netflix. If you want it bad enough and you will be willing to go to get out and get it, cool. I almost, when I was writing these up, I almost put in and remove DoorDash and other things like that mm. from your phone. Because this is a new environment we're living in where you're like, you don't have it, but with a click of a couple buttons, it could be at your door in 30 minutes. That's freaky. But even that I'm going to say is like not as bad as like mindlessly going over and grabbing the handful of M&Ms off of the printer table in your work office. That's what we need to get. Don't have processed, ultra processed crap readily available. Yeah. Or you could just move to like the woods in Maine where nobody delivers anything. So that's not like I've, I haven't used a DoorDash in eight years because it's just not, yeah. it's not useful. <laughs> But really, if you could do this, like I, yeah. I, I feel bad, you know, I really do. I know people personally that are struggling to get healthy and I go to their houses and I, I'm looking for like a glass or something to fill up a cup of water and over their cupboards and it's just, you know, bottom to top, just crammed with ultra processed, incredibly tasty, nutrient void, calorie dense foods that are going to incentivize you to take another bite. Goldfish, Nutri-Grain bars, those little bagged fruit snacky things, granola bars, all this stuff that comes in these packages. I'm like, oh my, you're burning up. You're either burning up so much mental willpower fighting that all the mm -hmm. time when you don't need to, or you're having it all the time. And having it every now and then again is not bad. But there's a difference between acute and chronic. If you're having, we'll use the birthday cake example. Birthday cake for the seven times of your family and friends, totally cool. Seven times a year, right? Every other month, totally cool. If you're having it seven days a week, all of a sudden people go, whoa, okay, I get it. Well, birthday cake is mm -hmm. not that far off from the other crap that you're having. You just got to recognize how crappy that stuff is. All right. Next one, consume a varied and unrestricted amount of vegetables and fruit. This is the opposite. 
to yep. get as much fruit and vegetables as you can. Like just get, and I really, I really think it's more the vegetables than the fruits because I'm a fruitaholic. Like I could, I could eat fruit. I could eat mm-hmm. pounds of fruit in a sitting, but the real thing is produce. Like just try to eat more produce, like more vegetables, more fruit. We can add that in there as well. And really what you'll see is now through these next couple is what we're trying to do is crowd out the bad choices. So you're trying to put these, force these good ones in. So there's not as much room for the bad ones as we go. So every meal snack on, you know, people make fun of me a lot. My neighbors, when I first met them, I was walking down the street eating, (laughs) eating a whole pepper, like an apple, just like (laughs) I've I've been made fun of for that as well. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's delicious. It is. Yeah, totally. You know, what's another weird thing is I would like that to me. I like that. I get excited about eating an orange or red or a yellow pepper like that. I would never eat a green pepper like that. No green pepper. Yeah. No. You know, it's wild. We did a taste test and green peppers often come out above the other ones. It's all in our heads. It's that's all, that's all in your head. I still won't do it though. Even I, though I know it's in my head that I don't like it as much, I still won't do it. <laughs> all right, dig it. Number three, eat three quarters of a gram of clean protein for every pound of body weight. So here's, if we do this, so recommendations are 0.7 to yep. one. That's kind of like, You know, someone like Peter Atiyah says it's one. Like we should all Mm -hmm. shoot for one. He's really pro-protein. I think that protein's really popular right now. Every macronutrient has their heyday. You know, low fat, low carb, high fat, you know, and now it's Mm -hmm. high protein. I'm going to be moderate in this and moderate is three quarters of a gram. It's also just very easy to remember and do the math. You know, if you're 200 pounds, have 150 grams, right? Is that, it's really easy to figure out what three quarters of your body weight is. And just for context, it's actually not that challenging. A big chicken breast has 45 grams of protein. So just kind of going off of that, if you have that equivalent three times a day for a 200 pound guy, you're there. But you just have to be fairly intentional because what ends up happening is people will go and have their oatmeal or their cereal or they'll skip breakfast. And then once you go there, now you're like, now you're kind of up against it. But if you have for a big guy, 200 pounds, if you have at least, you know, 40, 50 grams per meal, not that challenging. A big chicken Mm -hmm. breast has 45. Um, You'll get there, but we want to make sure we're there. Anything below seven, it's kind of like the sleep, anything below seven hours of sleep, anything below 7.7 grams um, is actually going to have detrimental effects. So just be a little bit above that. All right. Last one, avoid alcohol and added sugar. This is pretty straightforward. I don't think we need to spend a ton of time here. Sugar spikes blood sugar. Your pancreas releases insulin. That happens too much. You have too much insulin in the body. That's called hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia is the precursor to chronic disease. Alcohol does the same thing. It also messes your sleep. Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, That was the four tactics inside of the eat bucket. Let's jump into the think category. Number one, next time you're bothered by a small inconvenience, let it go. Number two, read psychology, human behavior and evolution, spirituality, stoicism, or philosophy every day. Number three, next time you're triggered, see it as an opportunity to develop your character. And number four, journal, meditate, or do breath work daily. Number one, next time you're bothered by a small inconvenience, let it go. Okay, so this is, we're really trying to make this actionable. So what we want to be able to do here is think about today, you're waking up and this is a part of your, you're on high alert. You're on high, high alert. You're trying to find something that's going to bother you today. And when it does, can you let it go? This is a huge thing. We have so many things that are like little inconveniences that we latch onto. Uh, In terms of the thinking thing, it's another way of saying never whine, never complain, never make excuses. But what we really want to do is shift out of this pessimistic mindset and look at all of the inconveniences. What you see, what you look for, you see more of. So we are trying to look for this, not to see more of it, to bring awareness to the fact that this is affecting us. So the example I like to give here is Small inconveniences, meaning things like traffic. Someone cuts you off. Now, other people are like, no, that's a big thing. That's a small thing. Small little things like 
you have to wait for three cars before you're able to pull into the gas station. Are you bugged by those things? Let it go. Like, are you getting upset about the temperature not being a perfect 72 degrees? Think of how off, if it's not the perfect temperature for someone, this is weird. If the, per, if the temperature isn't within a three degree span, plus or minus of what they want it to be, people get like bent out of shape about this. It's not the perfect temperature. So they try to bring, a, they're like, they get wrapped around the axle on it. That's a weird saying, wrapped around the axle. Wrapped around the axle. I don't know what that means. <laughs> That would be, that's got to come from some gnarly stuff back in like the, when, ca- when cars were first invented, he's all wrapped around the axle. Like people are just getting caught up in gears and pulled like for miles, like yeah. the dog in vacation. Okay. Yeah, cause, li- cause it must've started with somebody literally getting wrapped around an axle. Wrapped around an axle. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's gotta be like something like they were like, you know, I'm not gonna let this go. I'm not gonna let this go. Ah, they get sucked in like to a wood chipper. Uh, so yeah, learn to let things go. And a really good one is, can you just kind of do it with temperature? That's a really mm-hmm. good one. Even when it's sleep, like we talked about that. If it's not, you know, 68 degrees and it's 71, can you like not get upset about that? You're only going to make things worse. So learning to let go of things is huge in terms of our our psychology, huge in terms of our being able to live our best lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because if we're paying attention to that and we're giving it unnecessary attention, what are we not? Totally. What are we not giving enough attention to? And it could be any number of things. You you had uh, this great saying that I have borrowed and stolen and passed off of my own a number of times, which is own your attention. Yeah. Right. And yep. if you are bugged about all these tiny little inconveniences, you're not owning your attention. Anything can set you off. Number two, read psychology, human behavior on evolution, spirituality, stoicism, or philosophy every day. Yeah, this is to me, this is a big one to develop your mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, I like what, you know, Chris Irwin, a a friend of ours, badass, badass. Rare sense, rare sense. Rare sense, exactly. Yep. Yep. So badass Navy SEAL, career Navy SEAL, incredible guy. He has a a brand, a platform called Rare Sense. And it's basically, what he calls it is, what I love this term is mind fitness. You have to train it. It doesn't just, people are talking about like mindfulness, being present, mental health. Well, if we think of mental health on the spectrum of sick, well, and fit, you don't get to be a fit individual without training. You need to train your mind. You need to get your mind into this gym environment. You got to learn about this stuff. It's not good enough just like talk about your past. You need to train this stuff. And the best way to do it is to learn about the way the mind works. So read philosophy, read Nietzsche, read, you know, Socrates, read Stoicism, read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, read Ryan Holiday's stuff, read about um, spirituality, read Eckhart Tolle, read Michael Singer, read Deepak Chopra, find out about human psychology, Read about Freud, read Designing the Mind, understand about the ego and what it means, dive into biology about evolution. When I think something, what happens synapse-wise throughout my body? Evolutionarily, why have we been programmed the way we've been programmed from, you know, we're we're not just here, this moment. We are the, the outcome of thousands and thousands and thousands of honing this pattern, this default pattern that we are operating on. The more you understand about that, the more you can take ownership of it and pop up out of the matrix. My suggestion is don't read more than a paragraph. Really what I want you to do is read until you find something that you've learned and then stop. Don't keep reading. Your goal is not to finish a book. The not goal is not to read Every book by everybody I just named. That's not the goal. The goal is to read something until you've learned something, stop, pause on it, and really think about it, and then move on. Mm -hmm. Number three, next time you're triggered, see it as an opportunity to develop your character. Okay, this is different than the first one, which is learn to uh, see little conveniences and let them go. This is sort of that next level of it, which is maybe these aren't small inconveniences, it's a little bit bigger, right? And maybe it's the traffic thing. But this is, you're trying to 
pack up to leave the house and your wife is taking for, you're trying to go for date night and your wife is still mm-hmm. curling her hair and you mm-hmm. get triggered. You get into a bad mood. Tri- what triggered means is you're navigating your life along with your best self and something comes along. You're walking down the hallway on the path to your best self, which is at the infinite end of that hallway. You don't know how long away it is. You're walking along and you're enjoying your life. And all of a sudden something comes along and pushes you and slams you into a wall. You have been knocked off centered. The next time somebody or something knocks you off center, your homework assignment, your project is to only view that as an opportunity to work on your character. I'm not even saying you have to be better at it. Mm -hmm. I'm not even saying you have to fix it. All I'm saying is see it as an opportunity for you to develop better centeredness, better patience, better understanding, better compassion, better curiosity, better humility, better whatever commitment to a process, better. What is the character traits that are important to you when you get knocked off center? This again, going back to Chris's thing, you're now in the gym. Once you recognize that this is an opportunity to work on your character, well, guess what you get to do? You've now walked into the gym. All I want you to do is walk into the gym. Mm -hmm. Whether you decide to pick up the barbell or not, I'm not really that concerned about it. I just want you in the gym environment and just keep walking in the gym as many times as you can. Keep walking in, keep walking in. This is the mind gym. Until you recognize that there's an opportunity to work on your character, you're outside the gym and you're going, not going in there. I know that in there is a place for me to get stronger and better, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay on the couch. All we got to do is that mental fitness thing is recognize, ooh, I'm in a gym. I'm in the gym right now. Do I want to pick up the weights? Maybe, maybe not. I'm going to not be ready for them yet. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Last one, journal, meditate, or do breath work daily. Pick one. It doesn't matter to me what they are, but you know, I would even put there's, you know, Ryan Holiday stillness stuff. If this is yep. long walks in the woods, it counts. You don't get to count your drive time or shower time though. That's what a lot of people, I used to default to that. I was like, I'm a very cerebral person. I'm, uh, I have a lot of uh, peace, a uh, peace of mind. I'm comfortable in my own head. I have a really, I won't say easy, but creating a, a, a productive narrative in my head is readily available. I enjoy breaking down complex things into frameworks. And I would do that a lot in quiet times, which ended up being the shower in my drive to work. What I realized is when I started doing these other practices, it's not enough. That Mm -hmm. is not what I'm talking about because you need to create enough real space. The best way to do this, in my opinion, particularly for people that are just starting off, is after you do that short little read, and you've learned something from philosophy, psychology, stoicism, biology, evolution, whatever it might be. Once you've learned that, that's a great time to go in the backyard, close your eyes for five minutes and think about that. That's that's really what we want to do is you to think about your mind. Think about your place in in the cosmos. Not to Mm. get all weird and wooey and stuff like that. Think about what's important to you. That's what we want you to be doing in these moments. And journaling is a way to do that. Any form of fashion will lead you toward this eventually. Meditating certainly is. Breath work certainly is. So is long walks in the woods. But a daily practice of this, five minutes, if you really want to maximize mind fitness is the way to do it. Last bucket we've got is the connect bucket. Here are the four. Write down your values and live in alignment with them. Number two, remove complainers and gossipers from your social circle. Number three, hug someone daily for more than five seconds. And number four, spend at least two hours outside every day, preferably in nature. First one first, write down your values, live in alignment with them. You got to know what's important to you. That's really what that comes down to. What is important to you? And I think a lot of us go operate on what society says is important and really write down what are the important things. And the the coolest part about this is people are like, well, your values should never change. Totally disagree. Agreed. If you have the same values at 15 um, that you do at 
35 that you do at 75, I don't think we're growing and evolving. So you should be asking yourself this question a lot. So this is a question that's, what is most important to me? Certainly when I was 17 years old, um, my kids were not the most important thing to me because they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So your life is constantly evolving, changing. What is truly important to you should. Without understanding what is truly important to you, you don't know what you're steering towards. So you get thrown off center very, very easily. And the act of actually writing it down, and this is a small detail, but I think it's a worthwhile analog, handwritten, write it down, mm. not type it on a computer. That to me, that is, does, is it, if you like the exercise of thinking about this, okay, you, you are now a C-level student. You write it down on your computer, B-level student. If you want to get an A, write it down with a pen or pencil on a piece of paper, ideally that you'll see regularly. It's really important to know what is most valuable to us. Mm -hmm. And then the obvious part is then live your life in accordance with those things. Yeah, right. Number two, remove complainers and gossipers from your social circle. So connect has a few different pieces to it. One is connecting with yourself. You have to understand what's important to you. And so you can live your life in accordance with that. The next is connecting with other people. And, you know, we want to surround ourselves with people that lift us up, that make us better. Complainers and people that gossip are not those things. Um, they're toxic and not toxic in like, it's going to be traumatic. They're not, not like abusive or living with an alcoholic might be. But it is toxic in terms of like for you to live your best life is going to take extreme, extreme um, upward pressure to bust through that because um, you need to fight against a lot of natural downward pressures. All right. Number three, hug someone daily for more than five seconds. We've talked about the five second hug before. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the research shows that maybe this is longer than five seconds. You know, they say that oxytocin is released from 20 seconds like – what it, it, it doesn't matter to me. It's it's more about do you have people in your life that you can hug for or five seconds? Mm -hmm. I think that you snuggling your kids counts as this. It doesn't need to be standing up chest to chest with a boyfriend girlfriend high school dance style. <laughs> it could be it could be you know sitting on your big lazy boy with your four year old sitting in your lap mm -hmm. like that physical connectedness to people you love is really powerful. There is some sort of magic to the oxytocin, the other feel good hormones that come out of that. But this is really a proxy for, it's kind of like a lot of the other things, a very specific thing to get us to a bigger end point, which is mm -hmm. have people in your life that you are close enough to that you could hug on a daily basis for five plus seconds. Mm -hmm. And what that does, it gets us away from like the bro hug, right? If I see you, Patrick, and you, you yeah. know, we walk in the, I'm like, what's up, dude? And we give like the little bro hug and the pat, a pat, pat. And we, that's not a, a, a meaningful embrace. Right. All right. I'm going to look forward to a five second hug next time I'm at CrossFit New England then. <laughs> <laughs> Last one we've got on this long list uh, in our connect bucket, spend at least two hours outside every day, preferably in nature. So this, this came from not only from our challenge that we're, we, we, yeah, we're in we've been, of... yep, it's really hard, but you realize we start again, digging into some of the human evolution and this weird thing that we now spend most of our lives indoors in cities, by the way. And the city thing is really recent back uh, for the majority of our lives up until about 200 years ago, um, almost everyone didn't live in a city. It was under 10% of us lived in cities. Now it's over it's somewhere around 85% of us live in cities, by the way, only 15% of us want to be living in cities mm, and 85% do, which is a weird thing. Talk about chasing what truly matters. Where are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? But we want to get out in nature. There's a lot. We talk about these, even looking at nature has yeah. been shown to uh, boost good hormones and even being semi close to nature has been shown in uh, studies to benefit long-term health. There's a, one that we've wrestled with before where there's this project housing development and one uh, cohort stared at a parking lot. The other one stared out the back towards the woods. They studied these people for um, decades and decades. And what they found was the people that had access and stared at the woods 
were significantly and statistically healthier and happier than people that were staring at the parking lot. Like being in nature matters. When you go to Hawaii, they're so much more in tune with what's going on than we are. Mm. And that's really the way we were as a, as a species. We were just like all the other animals. It mattered what were happening with the weather pattern. It mattered what was happening with temperature. It mattered what the moon was doing. It mattered like all these animals migrate and they eat and they store to hibernate. And they're very in tune with the natural cycles, not only circadian rhythm of the day to day, but the season to season, everything else. And we've just lost that. And more and more is coming out showing that this is meaningful. So not only getting away from screens and artificial lights and temperature controlled environments into the outside, but getting into true nature. You know, I would also, I think that there's a lot to be said for being active in nature. That's not part of this, but, you know, going and sitting on the beach for four hours is a whole lot better than sitting at your desk. You know, mm-hmm. you going and swimming around in the ocean is better than just sitting on the beach. Like get out there and do the things. Two hours doesn't seem like a lot. And for people that have outside jobs, they're going to go, what the hell are you guys talking about? You know, landscapers and builders mm-hmm. and road construction guys. And they're going to go, what? I don't even know what this, what these guys are talking about. <laughs> for myself and everyone else that's working in a city or a, a white collar job or anywhere working at a supermarket, it's hard. Like it's it's, it's crazy how hard it is to get out there for at least. And I'm not saying you add up the time you walked to your car and the time you mm-hmm. walked from your car into Target and the time that you went and picked your kid up from yeah. soccer practice and watched the last three minutes of soccer practice. I'm saying get out into nature for two hour chunks. That's mm-hmm. what I mean. Mm-hmm. That's a lot more challenging than it sounds. Agreed. Uh, that challenge that Ben's referring to is something we did inside of the premium membership over at www.chasingexcellence.email. You can still join us if you'd like, or just come on in for whatever the next one is that we come up with. You can also get on the free newsletter list and we'll send you a link to a form. You can submit questions to uh, or for future episodes. We thank you in advance for doing it, Ben. Thank you. That was awesome. That was our 20 actions or 20 tactics to take in pursuit of the five factors of health. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Ben and I will be back soon for a brand new episode of Chasing Excellence. 